Hello and welcome to the second episode of Artist Talks. My name is Anton Van Bauer. I'm a founder of Deep Dive Dance, who is hosting and organizing and producing this series of talks with numerous artists around the world, with whom we will chat about life, their work, dance, art, and everything else in between. And today our special guest is a um, fantastic dancer, beautiful artist, a very talented teacher, and also a dear co ex-colleague of mine, Gina Tsai. And Gina is a former principal dancer with Royal Swedish Ballet in Stockholm, and her, her career path is really unique. Uh, it took her all the way from ballet school into musical theater, and back to the big, biggest, uh, of the world of ballet and during her tremendous career Gina excelled both in biggest classical and modern contemporary roles and to me personally she is a complete dancer in my opinion. Currently Gina is a founder and artistic leader of Ballet International School in Stockholm which she built from ground up with tremendous speed and success. So goes my first question to you. When did you know you wanted to dedicate your life to dance, if there was such a moment for you ever? It's funny because I've been thinking about this and I don't think I ever chose dance. Um, it chooses you. And I know a lot of dancers say that, but you know, you start when you're young and you just keep doing it because you love it and then it progresses into something else so for me there was never that moment of I'm gonna be a dancer that's just something I did and it just went on from there so it's as easy as that yeah. but my second question is I know from your personal story life because we are friends and ex-colleagues um, that you had a, a big injury right at the beginning of your career when you graduated, recently graduated Royal Ballet School in London, and uh, which forced you out of uh, professional ballet dancing. Mm -hmm. Would you talk uh, to our audience about this and how this experience made you feel back then, not now, with time passed, but back then when you were that young, when you dedicated this effort and countless hours of becoming a professional dancer. And then when this injury happened so early on, how did this feel? I mean, it, it's, it, I hadn't even started the career. I was literally on my first step graduating from upper school at Royal. And I think at the, the feeling of defeat, I felt, you know, you'd worked your whole life from 11 years old towards this final goal of getting a job, you know, and I think it came from emotionally not having my needs met and my last few years at school as a teenager with a lot of pressure and that affected the body. So I ended up having surgery and being off the last year of school and missing all the auditions, which you go off to. And that was it. And I was left and uh, it felt I was defeated. I felt very, very sad. And I felt that's it for me, I'm done. Not just physically, but mentally. 
you know, to first of all be off for a year with an injury is hard when you see your peers working towards their goal and you're just stuck. Um, and then second of all, not, not being able to go out and audition and knowing that that's it. There's no more school and that's your dream just kind of gone. That's how it felt then. Um, I thought there was no hope. So I stopped completely. And it was, yeah, it was not a, a good time actually for me. But then a very interesting thing happened in your life. <laughs> and you end up in a musical theater. I mean... <laughs> That was, it was funny because I was literally then I wanted to stay in London. Obviously, I've been living away from home for many years. I didn't want to go home. I was 17, 18 years old. So I got a job in a restaurant and it was the hardest job of all. And I was like, I need to be on stage. I need to at least be dancing. If it's not ballet, then I want to perform. And so a random open audition for the King and I musical came up. Yeah, for the first musical theatre, no musical theatre experience. Obviously, I've been in a ballet school my whole life. That's all I knew. Wasn't used to using my voice or being vocal. So it was a real new world. But for me, it was like, I just need to be back on stage. I need to be on stage. And I must say, I have, it was some of the best memories of my career being in musical theatre because it helped me grow my confidence. I have to be vocal. And I think the biggest thing that it taught me was how to reinvent a show eight times a week. So after the King and I musical, I went on to the Lion King musical. Yes. And we were doing that eight times a week, the same track, the same steps, the set, you know, and that's hard. I mean, that's tough just to do the same thing with the same energy. I mean, every audience is new. So you have to deliver it like it's the first time you've ever done a role. Yes, so yes. That's what that taught me. And um, the confidence to be just back on stage. And it, it helped me grow coming from, you know, a school where, I had to keep contained. I found yeah. my personality. I found myself, you know, so, yeah. That's great. Now you already answered my question about what you learned in this experience from musicals, but that's fantastic. Uh, um, really, your story is really unique in this way because there's not many that dancers that I can, like no one except you that I know who went from being a, a cast of, um, Lion King can do in so many various different roles in one musical for yeah. years and then end up being an, in Odette and Adil on point shoes in one of the biggest company in Europe. This is really uh, incredible. But uh, then, then when you were dancing uh, uh, back in the ballet, yeah. let's step ahead. When you were uh, performing leading roles uh, in a classical and in contemporary modern repertoire, what did it make you feel to, to be on stage? That moment to be a dancer, what it means for you? I think there's no feeling in the world when you love something so much to be able to share it with others. And that's, I think, the bottom line for me. It was, it was to be able to share this passion that you have for the art and be able to give it to people who may know nothing about dance or may, may, maybe they do, but to give them something, to be able to transcend them into another world, to be able to take them away from their daily lives. And I think that goes for us as dancers too. We can step out of our day-to-day -day lives, whatever troubles you're going through at home or this or that, you know, as soon as you step on stage and you're in that role, it's like almost like a meditation. It's almost like you just forget completely zone out and yeah, yeah. yeah right you, you just completely it's not even in your mind and I think from an audience perspective as well that's why we go to the theater to just be taken away same as why we watch movies or you know it's um yeah for me to be able to share that joy any, any special role during your career that really uh, kind of glued to you or was uh, that you fell in love with? Definitely Matt Sex Swan Lake. 
definitely. And I think also for me, even though I went on a little bit longer after that, for me, that felt like my final farewell. Yes. And then I have a follow-up question about uh, this. How many Swan Lakes, how many versions you performed? Oh. As a, as a lead role, how many? How many? Goodness. One, two, three, four, five? Oh, my God. That was, it's funny, Swan Lake's been my ballet, whether it be classical or modern. Yes. I mean, it could have been any ballet, of course, it was Swan Lake, one of the hardest to ever do, I think, as a female, the Odette, the Odile in the classical version. It's like climbing Mount Everest, you know, you have to take one step at a time. And I have a crazy story when I did the classical version. We were on tour with the Royal Swedish Ballet, I remember. This stayed with me. And we were, I think we were in Malmö or Gothenburg and everyone got sick. So I ended up doing five in a row. Oh my God. Back to back. And by my last one, I had a 42 degree fever and my legs were shaking in like when I, every time I'd done the fuetes. And I mean, it was, that was a marathon. So Swan Lake is the ballet that's kind of, I don't know, it's my ballet, whether it was the classical or the modern. Um, that's it, great. But, it, and, but um, during your dancing career, you, you successfully managed to jump from uh, pure classical roles into more modern or neoclassical, but also into some some works that were really deeply contemporary. For you as a dancer, as an artist, uh, body-wise and mentally-wise, how was difficult this process switching in between, working from... Well, I think what helped me in this was my musical theater history. Uh -huh. Lion King and Martha Graham. It was all Martha Graham. So you see, that in hindsight fed my versatility as a dancer. That's why I say to all aspiring ballerinas to try to keep your mind open and have a taste in every little thing around you. Because as an artist, as a dancer, you can put everything into play. And this is why I think being in a classical company that I could switch and swatch. It was hard on the body. Like I still have the pains now. Yes. But you have to be smart if you're doing, for example, when I was doing mats at Swan Lake, even though we were doing ballet class every morning, I'd incorporate squats in between each exercise at the bar, or I'd be doing another program on the side of it to help my turn in. Because obviously, even though we think we're turned in, we're not really not. Yeah build the strength in all directions and I must say after Max's Swan Lake I think it's the strongest in my legs I've ever been I mean I got a comment like Gina have you seen your leg you know I... after this um, dancing for so many years um, at the company mm -hmm. if it would be up to you what would you change if you had the opportunity, how could uh, dance ballet company uh, companies around the Europe world improve? I don't know. I mean, for me, I believe as we get older, as we become the older members of a company, we we I believe not all companies, but I do think that age is still a stigma within. You know, we get to a certain age, and of course, you have amazing dancers coming up and joining a company. But I, I believe as we get older, it's like a, a red wine. You know, you, you become more artistic the older you get because of the life experience you go through. And of course, I didn't dance how I retired and when I did when I was 24. And I think we can really value that in the older dancers of a company and feed it back in because we are there also to teach the younger, to inspire the younger, to to set the tone for the younger dancers. You know, I think there can be a bit more nurturing of the older dancers because we're going through enough mentally as we're, you know, coming to retirement. It's something you've done that you love so much and it's something that you suddenly have to leave. 
And I think for us to be incorporated a little bit more, whether it be working with the younger dancers or become character artists or, you know, to still have that on stage. And the use of these uh, years of growth as an artist. Yeah. That uh, can be used so much more out there because uh, dance, it's not only a physical effort. Of course, it's very physical, but there are a clear distinction between younger dancers and older dancers. Mm. How did you find yourself teaching kids about that? How did that happen? Teaching's always been in my life because my sister has a big academy. So from a young age, I would go into, in summer to my sister's academy in Hong Kong and do workshops. And so I've always been teaching, even when I was dancing. And I think the school started as a passion project. It was something I wanted to do on my day off. It started about five years ago now, do with mummy friends asking me to teach their children. And I was like, well, I have this idea, being in Sweden, being an expat, the international community is quite tight here. And I was like, well, let's see, let's do some classes on a Sunday on my days off. It was a passion project, you know? And it started with two small groups of six kids and it grew from there. And I loved it because it gave me something else back. Teaching three, four-year-olds is probably the hardest task because yeah. they tell you the truth. <laughs> and this is, for me, it's wonderful. There's no pretense. You know, what you see is what you get. And it helped me also, the more I taught, while I was still dancing, it was teaching me even more about my training because um, you have to practice what you preach. And it got to the point where teaching overtook and the love of teaching overtook, I would say my love to be on stage, if I can say that. It was a different reward, you know? It's about the student, it's about them. It's not about myself anymore. So the passion shifted slightly. Um, and yeah, it's grown from there. <laughs> How can a side project, as you said, at the beginning, yeah. could become and have this really rapid growth and tremendous success, I would say, in the little time that it exists, relatively little time? Passion. I think if you... If you do anything with full heart, perseverance, motivation, but passion, that's why we dance, no? I mean, it takes you through and it's the same with teaching. It's, I love what I do. I love, it's the same when I'm in a studio, it's like being on stage. It takes me away. It, you're solely involved with the person that's in front of you or the group that's in front of you. It's, emotionally connecting with people and again sharing your joy to others you know this this for me it felt like a responsibility also of me to to share this art whether people are learning ballet preferably maybe not to be ballerinas for example some of our adult classes not to be professional dancers but it's to create an audience for our shows, like three-year-olds, I'm teaching three to four-year-olds. Uh, a lot of people used to say to me, Jeannie, you're a principal dancer, why are you teaching three-year-olds? My goodness, it's the best age to teach, you know, because they are our future. Yes. Whether it be audience or dancers, we all started somewhere. I started at three, um, whether it's to, to to think that I've touched a child's life later, that if even if they're an accountant or a lawyer, that they're gonna go to the theater to watch a ballet or a dance performance or a modern because they did dance when they were younger. It's so important. So I believe being a dance educator or ballet educator, you know, it's, it's such a responsibility and also for children to feel good about themselves too. Yeah, or which, it develops, it develops motivation and perseverance and teamwork and compassion. And, you know, there's, there's so much more that ballet, yeah. a lot of 
us can think it's running around on our tippy toes no there's so much they learn without them even knowing that they're learning at a young age and as that develops through the years you see it within their social life you know so it's i think yeah i'm happy i found a second career a passion as big as my dance career yeah yeah no it's fantastic because of course uh, being a fantastic uh, dancer doesn't always translate to being a good or being passionate about teaching. This is not go together, not at all. I'm truly blessed with my students for entrusting me to educate them and to feel that, you know, I, this is possible also. And like I say, passion absolutely is the key. Uh, what would be your advice to, to younger dancers, to young aspiring artists? I think to keep an open mind. I think going back to my journey of going the unconventional way to becoming. Yeah. I really think when you graduate from school, if you don't get the job directly, doesn't mean you have to quit. If you still love it, you keep going, you keep persevering until you make it. And you take other ways to get where you want to go to. But yeah. you have to keep an open mind. You have to keep that passion because without it, it's too hard. Yes. So, yeah. You know, I think for young aspiring dancers to find an environment that can meet your emotional needs to make you feel good, to, to be able to find your own journey, because everyone's journey is different. Question is, why dance is important? Why dance is important? Like I mentioned before, I think we all need some escape from day-to-day -day routine. I think we all need to, to find that place where we don't have to think so much. And I think that's why it becomes important to dancers and why it becomes important to audience members. I think also it's beauty and it's joy and it's so built in us from when we're born, when you're a baby and you play music and you're rocking with the head, you know, it's so in tune in our bodies that it's a natural, it. yeah. it's a natural instinct. And I think you can't, it, that is why. It's part, it's part of our makeup as, as humans, you know, whether we're taught not to as we evolve, as we get older, but I, I really do. We need more beauty in the world. So yeah, absolutely. This is why it, it helps us express and share joy and love, dance, any type of form, any art, musicals, modern, contemporary, ballet. It's, oh, yeah. it's the same <laughs> we're taking everyone away and we're taking ourselves away yeah. okay so i think this is it for us today please uh share a word about uh ballet international work about gina uh, 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 come to visit the school support them any way you you can and follow our page on Facebook, Deep Dive Dance. And the next Friday at 7.45 p.m. Central European time, we will be back here and we will have another special guest. It's a secret revealed in a few days. So follow us. Uh, we thank you, Gina, for being with us today. Here on